And now, once again, let me welcome everyone to our webinar on Impact Investing to Conserve Nature. Today's event is co-sponsored by Harvard University's Conservation Innovation Forum and the Government Innovators Network at Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. Our moderator is James Levitt, Director of the Program on Conservation Innovation at the Harvard Forest and a fellow in the Department of Planning and Urban Forum at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. Jim will be starting us off today. Good morning to you all. It is a beautiful morning in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The sun is shining and um, we're, all, we're all happy to hear the, the news from um, uh, the Supreme Court and everywhere else, I will admit, uh, on this beautiful day. The topic of today's discussion is a very important and very innovative conservation finance facility which is uh, being spearheaded, run in fact by the Nature Conservancy. We will get into the details of that in just a moment. I want to add that uh, also sponsoring this presentation today is the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, Highstead, which is a foundation in Connecticut devoted to regional land conservation, and the Harvard Forest, which is a research unit of Harvard University. We have with us today uh, a fairly crowded room of about 53 people. Imagine yourself in a conference room that is, uh, that is full. There's people starting to stand in the back of the room. And I imagine that we will have uh, additional people in the back of the room in the next 15 or 20 minutes. So this is a really good context for discussion, for explanation, for softball questions and for hardball questions, and we invite them all. Um, today's guests are Bill Ginn and Charlotte Kaiser from the Nature Conservancy. And uh, I believe I said Nature Conservancy before. I, I'm thinking in the back of the, my, my mind I might have mentioned a different organization, but this is certainly a project sponsored by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and before we get started with their presentation, I want to ask Bill first, and then Charlotte, um, what was the path that you took that brought you to be involved in land conservation generally and in the financing of land conservation initiatives in particular? Bill, are you there? Uh, I am. Uh, thanks, Jim. And, and let me thank you and uh, all of your sponsors for your um, putting this seminar on and really creating a community of people who are interested in innovation and uh, new ways of thinking about conservation. So, so my path uh, comes from the private sector. Uh, I was a businessman um, before I joined the Nature Conservancy, uh, and I was an entrepreneur, owned my own company, uh, and then later did mergers and acquisitions for another big public company. That experience uh, is the experience that I bring to conservation. And in my career uh, at the Nature Conservancy, um, I have always been thinking about how do we apply the tools that Wall Street uses every day for um, conservation to get to the scale that we think we need to be at in order to make a difference in the future of the world. So um, that's the path that uh, I've been on, and I'm today the e Executive Vice President of the Nature Conservancy and NatureVest, which is the project that we're going to be talking to you about, is one of the projects uh, that I sponsor on behalf of the Nature Conservancy. Very good. Charlotte, can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit of your story? Sure. Thank you, Jim. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you, and thank you uh, for uh, producing this event and giving us the opportunity to share what we're working on. Um, <clears throat> my path uh, to, to land conservation, um, I think, probably starts with the house I used to go to every other weekend with my family um, in the Catoctin Mountains outside of Washington, D.C., um, which is now sits on 28 acres of land of forest, um, now surrounded by uh, suburban development um, because of uh, uh, perk regulations which were which were slackened in the early 2000s 
um, allowing for more development. And, and just being, um, having the opportunity over my career to work in landscapes as diverse as um, the rainforests of Indonesian Borneo and the concrete jungles of New York City, um, I've always been really focused on, on engaging the stewards and constituents of the natural resources of the planet um, in ways that supports their own self-interest and their own need for economic development and growth. Um, and today I feel that the stewards and constituents that I'm, I'm most focused on engaging are investors um, and the suppliers of capital. And I feel incredibly fortunate to be part of a fabulous team at NatureVest that's innovating in, in a lot of ways around massively scaling up the work we're trying to do with the Nature Conservancy with private capital to support conservation. All right, very good. Charlotte, I want to remind you in particular to uh, have the microphone close to your, to where yeah, you're. I just noticed it is, was not close. Is that a little better? That's much better. Thank you. Great. Now everybody can hear clearly. Um, all right. Well, with that fine introduction, let me ask the two of you who I understand are going to tag team this presentation to, to begin. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, I'll, I'll start uh, and introduce uh, NatureVest and our thinking behind uh, the creation of, uh, of NatureVest. First, what, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Um, I think we in the conservation movement are struggling to um, do projects, to do work that makes a difference at the scale of the world. Um, and that takes money and resources. From my perspective, I think there's almost no case to be made that there's enough philanthropy or even enough government money that we can accomplish the conservation goals facing the world. We need, I think, to figure out how to engage the private sector in this great, transformative, important work which we feel is at the center of um, human well-being on this great planet that we live on. So we created a venture called NatureVest uh, to really highlight work that we've been doing really over the last 20 years to develop innovative ways of partnering with the private sector, specifically investors who are interested in our mission but who are also uh, return-seeking that is to say they want their money back. This is not philanthropy. And we're looking for ways to use this platform to achieve greater scale towards the mission of the Nature Conservancy. It's a collaboration uh, of J.P. Morgan Chase, um, which is one of the major banks of the world, as I'm sure you know. And in some ways, that says volumes about the fact that there's a great deal of interest um, in the private sector about new ways, of new business categories of investment, as well as support from the Grantham Foundation and the Robertson Foundation. We really have, um, as the slide shows, um, three things that we're trying to do. First, our purpose, as I said, was to deliver conservation impact in ways that generates financial return. Secondly, we have a goal uh, between now and 2020 of trying to do a billion dollars worth of projects uh, across the world. We picked a billion dollars because, you know, we want to do something that we think is relevant uh, for the future of the world, and we will show you how we're going to try to accomplish that. Our strategy is straightforward. Um, we do transactions, we do deals, um, and we hope that those deals can be replicated not only by ourselves, uh, but by others. Um, we're looking for and sourcing capital uh, from the Nature Conservancy's family of supporters and hopefully new supporters um, who are drawn to this investment opportunity. And finally, we're sharing knowledge as we are here today and our experience because the Nature Conservancy, Nature Vest can't do this alone. We need everyone to be thinking about how this can apply to their work and how they can use their supporters and donors to stretch the work that they ordinarily would be uh, unable to do without new ways of thinking about this work. Now, we started this work with some assessment of what it is that 
um, the field needed. And that research report uh, is available online, and uh, I, we would be very welcome to share with, with all of you, with links to all of you. But the, the key finding here is that there's a lot of interest in this field. Um, in fact, billions of dollars uh, are being spent um, around conservation uh, ideas by government uh, and by private sector um, actors. The biggest focus areas for that work is around sustainable food and fiber, timber, agriculture, habitat conservation, a second, um, and thirdly, and we think this is growing, water quality and quantity across the world. Now, what's interesting is that when you talk to family offices, foundations, private investors across the world that are interested in this sector, they say that they would like to triple the amount of investment that they're making in these areas. But they're having a real shortage of finding transactions that meet their criteria. And that is the essence of why we created NatureVest. We believe that we need to show the way help investors uh, envision what the structure and type of transactions that are possible out there um, can be created using the tools that NatureVest is pioneering. The goal here is to create transactions. The, and this is really borne by the fact that the research shows that there's plenty of capital interested in this, but just not enough places uh, to actually make those investments. So that's our goal, that's our focus, is to create the investment climate and deliver on the transactions that we think are possible. Charlotte, over to you. Thanks, Bill. Sorry, I was just having a little trouble advancing the slide. Um, great, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what, it, what makes a nature vest transaction and then um, present a few of the sample deals that we're working on today. So, we're at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, as Bill said, we're looking for opportunities to collaborate across the conservation finance field, um, but the work we're doing is aligned to the global priorities of the organization, which are, as you see on this slide, uh, focused on um, addressing the threats posed by climate change, conserving land at an unprecedented scale, preserving the quality of the world's freshwater ecosystems, uh, saving the world's marine systems, and developing resilient cities into the future. So our deals are, are aligned with those five priorities, in some cases more than one, and they all generate cash flows, obviously, and have a critical need for impact capital to achieve a new scale and accelerate um, investment in natural capital and the valuing of nature um, as, a, as an investable asset. We're looking for deals at size. Um, obviously, it's the same transaction cost for a $500,000 transaction as for a $50 million transaction. Um, and we're also focused on the size of the impact. So a small deal in Africa that achieves 2 million acres of conservation outcome is gonna outweigh a small deal in the United States that achieves less. Um, and, and as Bill referenced earlier, we're really looking at deals that can be scaled, that can be replicated so that we're creating models that can be carried forward in uh, potentially pooled vehicles and at least repeated in multiple geographies in multiple regions and, and hopefully by multiple partners. And finally, uh, the deal criterion that the deal needs to meet the criterion of readiness, uh, which is to say the policy environment needs to be there, the enabling conditions need to be there, the on the ground execution partners need to be there, and we collaborate closely with the uh, government relations colleagues and the science colleagues and the, and the corporate engagement team that we have at the Nature Conservancy to start to build readiness for deals kind of further down the pipeline so that we can continue to execute on new opportunities going forward. So today our pipeline of deals that we expect to close in the next 12 to 18 months is about $400 million. Uh, that includes, um, from a dollar perspective, mostly land deals. Um, but from a deal numbers perspective, uh, there's about a dozen on the list, and, and I believe five are in land. Um, we're looking at a fund in, in water that I'll talk about shortly that's trading water rights in the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, we're looking at ways to invest in resilient cities in Washington, D.C. with a $3 million pilot that we expect to uh, 
replicate uh, in cities across the U.S. who are facing Clean Water Act regulations. Um, and we're working on uh, some fisheries deals and uh, to, in, in ocean conservation and some really interesting debt swap transactions to finance climate adaptation by small island developing states, including a deal we'll be closing at the end of this year in the Seychelles. Am I okay for sound, Jim? Is this you're, you're, you're right on. Uh, just Great. Keep, keep going with your pace and your sound and everything. Great. So we, as, I, as the previous slide uh, said, we've got two closed deals so far. We're pretty excited. We've got $140 million deployed of impact capital into conservation. Uh, one of those was, uh, you may have all heard about in the Great Western Checkerboards region of Montana and Washington State, 167,000 acres of land conserved with $134 million of impact investing and philanthropic capital. Uh, the great majority of that was not, uh, was, was, uh, was impact equity uh, and um, we're, we see this as a model for large landscape conservation at scale that no longer relies on the balance sheet of the Nature Conservancy. Um, much smaller uh, and across the world is a $7 million transaction that I led in Kenya um, investing in a new social enterprise called NRT Trading, which is a for-profit subsidiary that's been created by our partner, the Northern Rangelands Trust, that provides access to markets for pastoralist herders um, of cattle in exchange for them converting to sustainable holistic land management grazing practices that improves the condition of the grasslands, creates uh, improved habitat for elephants and rhinos um, and diminishes human and wildlife interactions. Uh, the result of this project is increased income for the pastoralists as they get better prices for their cattle um, and greatly reduced poaching of elephants in the region um, at a time when Africa is seeing an explosion tragically in elephant killing. I think this is a nice example of the diversity of deals that we're doing. Uh, the Great Western Checkerboards project is obviously uh, a very traditional, in some ways, land acquisition and conservation deal, very similar uh, to the kind of work the Nature Conservancy has been doing for more than five decades, but it's a new kind of capital that allows us to, to operate at a new scale. Um, and in Kenya, we're we're providing a debt and an equity investment into a new social enterprise, uh, which is a brand new transaction for us as an organization. So now I'll talk a little bit about a few deals that we're working on today that we hope to close uh, in the next year or so that's part of that $400 million pipeline. So first, continuing on the theme of, of uh, new models for the Nature Conservancy and for investing in conservation, we're participating in a new market that the District of Columbia government has created in stormwater retention credits. Um, stormwater is one of the fastest growing sources of pollution into America's waterways. Uh, it's the only growing source of pollution into the Chesapeake Bay, which is a critical conservation priority for many of us on the call and per certainly for the Nature Conservancy. And as urban sprawl grows in the region, which is where I grew up, uh, rainwater is increasingly becoming a pollutant and not an asset as it lands on pavement, um, becomes, uh, picks up heavy metals and other uh, uh, contaminants and, and washes into the Chesapeake. So stormwater retention with green infrastructure, such as the image you see on this slide, um, is a low-cost way to uh, eliminate that pollution and create assets in communities that may be underserved in green space. Um, and so the retention credit market allows for downtown developers who are building lot line to lot line buildings to meet their stormwater retention standards in part by purchasing credits uh, in projects such as the one in this photograph. So we're raising a $3 million fund. Um, uh, the structure is actually a little different from this slide. It's a little outdated. It's all equity. Um, we're in, we're close to, to uh, having a confirmed investor and an institutional investor uh, in the region, and we're uh, going to be investing in stormwater retention projects and sell those to developers. What's exciting, it's a very pilot scale fund, only $3 million, and that's because this is a new policy. It's been in place for a little over a year. We've only seen two transactions, but we think that the presence of capital to finance the development of these stormwater retention projects 
will really kickstart the market. And if we see that happening, we plan to expand the fund uh, by a factor of perhaps 10. And then the other exciting thing about this is that the stormwater uh, credit trading policy that the district has enacted is of great interest to cities like Chicago and Seattle and others who, are, who have similar challenges around uh, real disparity in land development costs and a growing stormwater pollution problem. So we think that we can, the, by, by demonstrating the effective, effectiveness of this policy and creating a true market for uh, green infrastructure stormwater retention, will facilitate the uh, export of this policy to other cities and we can grow this vehicle even further. Moving uh, west a little bit and south into Appalachia, uh, we've got a project that is a little, is more similar to uh, the Great Western Checkerboards in that it's a kind of classic land deal but done in a new way uh, with new outcomes and new capital. Uh, so in Appalachia, there's 50 mountaintops running up the chain um, that are beautiful forests such as you see here um, in danger of being blown off uh, with mountaintop removal um, by coal mining companies. This deal seeks to acquire the surface rights of 100,000 acres on a critical corridor between two protected areas along the Cumberland Trail and retire the mining rights, there's a typo, sorry, on at least 15,000 acres of high conservation value areas. The idea is to use this deal to catalyze the transformation of land use in central Appalachian coal country facilitating the transition from surface mining to sustainable forestry, um, using revenues from forest carbon and recreation to invest in a community development fund um, and, other, uh, and other ways to help, help convert the economy from the coal economy to the restoration economy. Uh, again, this is a single transaction, but we see line of sight to a much larger opportunity uh, once we close this deal. We're currently in negotiations with landowners, um, and this is a combination of debt and equity uh, with some philanthropy to support our deal development costs. And I'm seeing a question uh, on the screen, I'm trying to close my window, um, about whether or not there's any project that does not rely on some kind of philanthropy. It's a great question. Today, no. Um, and, I, and I am not uncomfortable about that. I think that we are, as Bill said, developing and proving new models today. And the risk of doing that uh, is high, and the, the returns on the transactions themselves do not always compensate for that risk. So the philanthropy is there to buy down that risk, to pay for the deal development costs for proving out the models, and then the goal is that having, having done a transaction that's replicable, you're able to repeat it at lower risk uh, and, and with less subsidy going forward. Okay, moving to the next deal. Here's our Murray Darling Basin uh, uh, Balanced Water Fund. So in Australia, 40% of the agriculture production out of that country is in the Murray Darling Basin, which is the world's most engineered uh, river system and uh, also the world's most um, perfected and liquid, sorry for the pun, water market. So we are, the, the uh, hydrology of the system is, is multi-year, so you have periods of dry years followed by uh, wet years. And in the wet years, the intermittent wetlands in the system aren't, don't receive the wet water that they need to because of the engineering and the levees. Uh, that prevent the water from flowing over the, over the top and rewatering the wetlands. And at the same time, the water values are much lower because farmers who own water rights uh, have, aren't in need of, of additional water which they would purchase on the open market. So our fund plans to purchase uh, very high security water rights uh, and then sell the annual allocations of water that go to those rights to farmers in those dry years when water prices are high and agricultural needs for water are likewise high. In the wet years when farmers, when the market is down, farmers aren't buying as much water, we will return our water to the wetlands. We will actively pump water out of the system and into these wetlands uh, with a partner on the ground who's been doing wetland restoration for years. We're targeting privately held wetlands in Aboriginal communities. This river basin is uh, home to the longest continually present human culture in the world, 60,000 years of people living here. 
Um, and so we're providing really important kind of cultural restoration as well as environmental restoration through this fund. This is a $25 million fund. There's $5 million of senior secured debt and uh, the rest is common equity of which the Nature Conservancy is, an, is a participant um, and we're targeting kind of high single digit returns. What's interesting about this deal is that we're already seeing potential application um, in other river basins in the western U.S., in China, where they've announced they're going to create seven water markets in seven river basins that look just like the Murray Darling water market, um, and in Mexico and Chile. So again, the kind of replicability of the deal is really important to our involvement. So finally, um, the projects that I've talked about to date are those that we have in development. They're focused on accredited investors and high net worth individuals because of the risk and the kind of bespoke nature of each of the transactions that I've described. Um, the Nature Conservancy also has a retail debt offering which allows for impact investors interested in supporting conservation outcomes to participate at a more modest level. Um, and that's our conservation note. And it's debt on the balance sheet of the Nature Conservancy. Um, we're a AA credit. Uh, it's secured by our full faith and credit. Um, and it's used to support the conservation work that we're doing all over the world. Um, uh, we've supported transactions mostly in North America, also in Canada. And uh, the capital from the conservation notes is also supporting or will be supporting uh, the Murray Darling deal as well as our Seychelles debt swap. So it's a, it's a sort of bifurcated approach to appeal to both retail and accredited investors and broaden the market for conservation investing. So that's the end of our slides. Um, I'm happy to take questions for me or Bill. All right, so um, let me kick this off and we have several questions that are already on the site for this webinar, I invite all of the very impressive group of people who are online right now, please put your questions in the Q&A section and I will try to get to as many of them as I can. As the moderator, I want to ask the first of these questions. Bill, you stated very clearly um, at the beginning of this that the one of the critical limitations that you have is finding deals that merit financing and putting them into the pipeline. That is, there's not necessarily a shortage of deployable capital. There's not necessarily a shortage of land or resource which needs to be protected. But finding uh, a context in which there is a deal that's financeable and which can have a cash flow to repay that debt or meet the expectation of equity investors, that's the constraint. If, if I've heard that correctly, my question for both Bill and Charlotte is, how do you expand that population of deals? What techniques have you found are the most effective in expanding that population deals that are financeable? So it's a great question, Jim, thanks. Um, and um, look, we, everywhere we look, we see undervalued natural assets, whether it's fisheries, whether it's water, um, whether it's um, uh, the revenue streams from uh, forestry activities, from uh, carbon sequestration capabilities of our soils. And so our, our goal here is to really demonstrate in a broad number of categories that you can actually think about those natural assets as business assets. Um, so this is about our, our way of thinking about this is to actually show what a water deal looks like so that somebody in California or in Arizona can say, oh, I could do that in my state if they can do it in Australia or show a fisheries deal as we have done in California and Morro Bay, where the Nature Conservancy is the second largest permit holder of groundfish resources um, in the California coast, to show that in the same way that you could then apply that to, say, the coast of Maine or the Gulf of uh, Mexico or Chile or some other place. So it's really about showing the transactions that actually work and then sharing them with people as a way to build this um, basis. 
Now, I would just simply say that if we look back, say, 10 years, the energy efficiency market, the solar market, we're operating in this realm of uh, hybrid capital subsidized by government, subsidized by nonprofits, trying to develop um, these kinds of programs. And then fast forward today, 10 years later, there's billions of dollars flowing into solar. There's billions of dollars flowing into energy efficiency. And that's all been created because people began to get the idea that actually these are really investable assets and they gained market confidence as they saw some transactions done in these areas that they could do this um, as well. So we see a similar pathway. I mean, does anyone think that water isn't, you know, ripe for market interventions uh, that will increase the efficiency of our use? Of course, we've got lots of opportunities like that ahead of us if we can really show what those transactions look like. Charlotte, let me ask you, you said during the conversation that you saw a line of sight from one of the deals that you were discussing to several much larger deals uh, that are a little further in the future. Uh, are those lines of sight appearing uh, frequently in your work? Uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely does depend. I would say, for example, in the Cumberlands deal, when I say we have line of sight, that means we have a lot more mountains we want to buy. Um, and we're having conversations with landowners about buying them. So that's pretty clear and straightforward. In the, uh, in the District of Columbia stormwater deal, I think if we have a line of sight to a bigger fund within the district, we also have a more uh, sinuous line of sight to uh, investing in this kind of vehicle in other cities should they implement these kinds of policies. So I think as Bill, as Bill was saying, there's models that we're trying to demonstrate the efficacy of, efficacy of and it's our anticipation that others are going to adopt those models. The policy lift involved in doing so is greater or lesser depending on the market transaction that you're talking about. Great, great answer. All right, well, so now I have some questions from uh, from the audience that I'm, I'm getting on the website. Uh, the, the first quick question is, who will implement the revenue generating programs in the projects? That is to say, how do you identify bankable organizations that you can do these deals with? So that's, that's really the role of nature. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, it's really the Go role ahead. of nature uh, to try to create these transactions and, and manage them. Um, so, uh, in, in almost every one of these instances, we're creating LLCs or partnerships um, with our investors to manage and direct these assets. Um, but the Nature Conservancy will be a key source of operational asset management uh, capacity. But I would not uh, suggest that would be the only way. Uh, in the future, for example, our uh, Stormwater Project is a 50-50 joint venture with a for-profit fund, and, and over time, uh, the balance of the Nature Conservancy's investment in this area and the investment of the private sector may change. You might see us actually create a company to do this work. Uh, for example, um, that's a for-profit company for which we are a shareholder. So it will depend a lot on the circumstances and the location across the world and the capacity to do this. In the fisheries deal, just one other example, while we acquired all those assets, we are now busily um, selling those assets to cooperatives um, who are now ready to assume, reassume really ownership on behalf of their communities, those fishing rights using the template, the science, the new harvesting techniques, the market uh, connections that we developed during our tenure. So you might see us be an owner for a period of time and then transition to other owners who uh, are in a better position to steward this, uh, this work going forward. NRT trading, the deal in Africa is through a partner. They're managing the actual on the ground, the slaughterhouse, the 
uh, the cattle improvement program. We're an investor and a partner in helping them create that work. So there is no cookie cutter solution, but you're, you're wise to focus on asset management because in the long run, stewarding these assets, and in many cases when we talk about water assets, you're talking about decades of ownership and management, and you have to plan for that uh, going forward, and that's quite an important uh, part of every transaction we do. Very good. Charlotte, do you want to add to that, or should I just go to the next question? I think we're ready for the next question. All right. So, John, the, the last question uh, I want to note was asked by Clifford David. John Bartlett asked the following question. How is the conservation interest assured in the land deals? You don't want to end up with dirt and stumps. Uh, well, it's the very good point. No, we don't. Uh, so we use uh, our traditional conservation tools, uh, easements in particular, to ensure the permanent conservation of the land that we're that we're acquiring, or that rather the acquisition vehicles are acquiring. Um, we're also partnering with uh, managers of the land to ensure uh, timber management uh, at FSC or higher standards. Um, and then our exit strategy is, uh, in, is to conservation buyers, whether public or private, uh, to ensure the permanent conservation outcomes that we're seeking. Okay. So uh, part of the answer to that question is through legal agreements that ensure the long-term stewardship of the properties in which you're yeah. involved. Okay. Bill, yeah, that's the, that's the end. Yeah, well, I would just say that that's the end state that we're trying to achieve here. I mean, here, here's, here's the problem that a lot of our land deals are trying to solve for. We know that federal and state takeouts are getting longer and longer um, in duration. And the ability to, say, buy a piece of property and a year later uh, sell it to the Forest Service or the Park Service or some state or county agency is getting more and more difficult because they have to plan and map these out for a very long period of time. Enter our conservation land investors, and we have quite a few of them um, that are working with us now. And their goal is to help provide us the capital at very, very low cost um, to um, have much longer time horizon to hold properties and find conservation outcomes associated with them. So that's the key thing with many of our land deals. It isn't that the outcome will be different. It's just that we're now creating products that will allow us to really be patient and have real patient capital to assure that the ultimate outcome that we and everyone would like to see for these properties gets achieved but because there isn't the money today to do it, we lose the opportunity uh, if we rely on, say, conventional bank debt or even our in much higher priced internal sources of TNC capital versus what we're getting from investors. Okay. We, uh, we started out this morning with about 50 participants. I want to point out to all of you that the room continues to be more crowded, which is an indication that the conversation and the content are valuable to people. There are now 84 people in the room with us. Uh, I have two questions that are focused on particular projects that we've talked about. The first from Stacy McMahon. In the District of Columbia, what is the value of a storm router credit and what is the cost to produce, to produce the certified credit through a GI project? I'm sorry, I don't know what GI means, but you probably Green infrastructure, discuss. yeah, I'll right. take that one. So that's a good question. I think the price discovery is a really important role that we believe our development company is going to play. Today, uh, developers uh, are required to uh, retain the first 1.2 inches of stormwater on their sites either uh, through on-site management, through the purchase of credits for up to 50% of their total requirement, or by paying an in-lieu fee to the district of $3.50 per gallon of water. Uh, so that's the price ceiling, $3.50 a gallon. Um, the District of Columbia has agreed to uh, guarantee the purchase of credits that our development company uh, creates at a floor of a dollar. 
So the price is somewhere in between those two. Uh, and we believe that we can execute uh, project development um, at a, uh, a price somewhere in between um, uh, that we, we believe that we would be able to sell them at $2, around $2, um, and, and develop them at a cost below that in order to create return for our investors. But, but there's been two transactions on this, in this uh, policy regime so far, um, and the prices actually were much higher than that, um, which we think is, is having kind of a chilling effect. Um, and it was done, it was a sort of a strange case where a, a building really needed their CFO, and they needed to meet their stormwater requirements, and so they were sort of in an emergency situation and paid up for credits. So a second question that falls on the heels of that relevant to the same topic from Hillary Swain in Florida is as follows. Significant change for efficacy of water investments is evaluating, documenting, and measuring deliverables based on our experience in Florida with FRESP and Northern Everglades PES, Payment for Ecosystem Services, as well as contract compliance. How do you, how do we cope with these many idiosyncrasies? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think defining performance and outcome is really critical to these green infrastructure programs. Um, and so what we have in the District of Columbia is gallon of stormwater retained is our outcome. It's very straightforward. It's actually an engineering standard that you can meet with a bioswale or rain garden or other uh, project, um, and you can have an engineer sign off on, on that deliverable. Uh, and so we're, we're not tying ourselves to actual, you know, particulate matter dissolved in the water. We're not tying ourselves to, to, to the kind of end outcomes that we're seeking. We're, we're, it's interesting we talk about green and natural infrastructure, but at the end of the day, we're meeting an engineering deliverable. Okay, so Ted, Ted Holt asks, what are the projected returns for these projects as compared to market returns? For example, the S&P uh, delivered about a 13% return in 2014. To what extent do private foundations take a first loss position to enhance return for investors? So our returns vary on the deals and whether their market rate also varies. Um, so on our livestock to markets deal, the debt portion of that investment is a 0% seven-year loan. So in no universe is that market rate. Um, the reason for that is that the uh, execution risk on a brand new social enterprise uh, in a geography like Kenya is extremely high uh, and, and we have a very philanthropically minded investor who's putting up that capital who's willing to take that risk. Now, if we overcome that execution risk uh, and, and five years from now have paid off that loan, that enterprise is going to be able to access much more market rate capital from local lenders. Uh, and that's our goal and that's part of that story of the pathway to scale that we were talking about earlier. On the other hand, in the Murray-Darling Basin, we're getting market rate returns, we think, on, on asset-backed equity in a 10-year fund. We're targeting, um, as I said, high single-digit equity returns over 10 years. Um, I'm not going to comment on the uh, viability of 13% annual on the S&P and whether we're in a bubble, um, but I do think that we are able to offer kind of comparable returns for the asset class, um, and yes, we are using in some cases uh, philanthropic subsidy, again, to buy down some of that new model execution risk that I mentioned earlier. Bill, do you want to add to the wisdom on the subject of the cost of capital, debt capital, equity capital, and how you shape these deals to, to fit that um, demand? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Um, you know, first, uh, there is an enormous amount of capital out there that people are trying to think about how to invest. And if you talk to someone about their balance sheet and supporting you, they think about, well, for philanthropy, maybe I can spend 5% of my, uh, of my uh, earnings on an annual basis for, for philanthropy. But if you ask them about uh, and suggest that maybe there's an opportunity to use the rest of their balance sheet, the, the portion that they, you know, are saving for the future um, for a, a social or conservation outcome, 
then that attracts and focuses on a much bigger part of the, the bucket, if you will, of potential dollars. So, so we're not focused on the 5% philanthropy side uh, because that's a pretty fixed and small marketplace. We're really trying to figure out how do you just serve up transactions that appeal to that 95% of someone's, you know, equity uh, that they might consider for investment. So that, that's point number one. Point number two is that, um, you know, we talk to a lot of high net worth individuals and um, Many of them have already taken the giving pledge or have concluded that they're going to give away the large majority of their assets upon their death. Um, and one of the value propositions uh, that we've found in discussing this with them is, well, what if you could give your money away two or three times in your life by making impact investments that um, have a high probability of returning your capital um, uh, and allowing you then to recycle that capital into a new project. So that's the second kind of investor, someone who is very keen um, to use their resources while they're alive in ways that further their cause and if they can do it two or three or four times uh, by investing in different projects that return that capital, they're very interested and excited about that kind of opportunity. Probably the least attractive source of capital for all these transactions are people who are only interest in is maximizing their return. If that's your only interest, then that we're not the vehicle for you. Um, we're the vehicle for people who are wanting to put their money where their hearts are, where their impact uh, is, but recognizing that they have certain limits on what they can actually do. And it, it doesn't include making a gift of that capital, but rather recycling it and using it for other purposes, including perhaps their own or their children at some point in the future. So that is a very big marketplace. Um, and that's the space that is so interested in these transactions. And it includes foundations, it includes high net uh, individuals, high net worth individuals, uh, and lots of others who want to make investment in these spaces. And we have yet to begin to even scratch the surface of available capital in this category. I suppose when we run out of people that have those interests, then uh, fine, um, we'll need to hope that our projects like the stormwater project have graduated to a market-based solution where anybody who's a developer sits down and says, well, should I build you know, a stormwater retention green tank in the bottom of my building or should I buy a green infrastructure credits that are gonna build a park somewhere in Washington, D.C. to deal with that stormwater runoff, which is the cheapest for me as an, uh, as an investor. We hope our products will graduate to that place where they will compete in the marketplace um, as they should to uh, create conservation assets at the same time they're solving a developer's problem. So Carl DePoll asked a question that's related to your answer just now, Bill, which is how do you feel about more public and private partnerships to create win-win situations for conservation? I think uh, that that the answer, you've already tipped your hat on that, but my question is sometimes there's, um, ex there are explicit public programs to invest in new ideas that will uh, create markets. Is there, a, uh, is there an interest at NatureVest in, help in, in working with those kind of institutions to find the investable capital for these kind of projects? Yeah, look, I mean, there's almost nothing that we're doing that isn't, at the end of the day, a creature of public policy. Just let me give you one of the oldest examples uh, out there. We decided as a nation that we wanted to provide good quality, low-income housing for, uh, uh, for people in this country and housing for elderly people in particular. The government created a tax credit program that incentivized investors to develop their properties for those interest groups. And as a result, 
billions, if not trillions of dollars have flowed into the creation of affordable housing stock for elders and poor people across this world. So public policy has everything to do with this. If we want to address climate change, we need to develop market-based mechanisms. The stormwater example that we've talked so much about here today is the creation of public policy that allows this to occur. We've decided we want to clean up the Chesapeake Bay, and stormwater is a huge problem associated with that. And we want to give people a flexible toolkit to allow them to have different choices besides purely engineered concrete basins someplace. So these are all things that we need to work on um, as we roll out these programs across the world and the United States is to create the enabling conditions. There's no shame in that. In fact, it's absolutely critical. So the public-private partnerships that these examples represent um, are absolutely uh, the future as we make determinations as a society, what are the values that we want to see um, in our government, in our communities. That's a great, that's a great answer. Okay, we, we are, I just wanna point out to people that we are about seven or eight minutes from the noon hour, which I think is when we're going to uh, conclude this session. So if you have any uh, questions that you wanna ask, now is the time to get them in because we can only take two or three more. I have, uh, I have one more that actually is my own question, which is, you, there's an implication in what you're talking about that there's kind of an experience curve for bankers. That as we get a couple of these deals done and we um, use brain cells to do that, then it becomes easier and more efficient and less expensive to do those deals going forward. And the, uh, the likelihood that a market emerges from that becomes greater and greater and greater. My question for you is, what are the role of standards that are used now mostly by multilateral lending institutions for these kind of deals in helping to sort of accelerate that learning curve? Do, this, do the standards make any difference to you all at this level, or is that something that we're gonna to get to further down the line? Well, I mean, I think it's important. Uh, I mean, let me just give you one example that's being discussed out there, green bonds. Everybody and their brother is releasing a green bond, which in 90% of the cases is something that they would have done anyway, um, but now it's a green bond. Um, and so we do have to be careful here to really distinguish transactions that are actually achieving real outcomes that would not have happened uh, without the you know, efforts that we've just outlined here. And not just rest our laurels on, oh, uh, you know, I'm building a uh, wastewater treatment plant that's required by law, therefore that's a green bond, and I am therefore uh, able to market that, you know, to investors as a green outcome uh, for my company, even though that's not really anything different than you meeting your regulatory requirements. So I guess the, the challenge for me here in this space is to make sure that as we proceed here, we do the monitoring and the outcomes so that we don't have this sector get a bad rap um, because it is oh, it's all green, but then when you look under the, uh, the tent, there really isn't any evidence that anything different is happening in the world. That would be a bad outcome here. We need to be able to show, demonstrate, monitor that fishermen are prospering because of our work, that water trading is creating efficiencies, that we are bending the trajectory of climate change because we made real investments um, we are really protecting land, not just talking about, oh, well, we're in the forest business and forestry is a green business, right, um, without any real long-term outcomes for conservation. So standards Great. are going to be critical. Great. Charlotte, do you want to add to that or, or move ahead? Let's move ahead. All right. So I have a question from Lee Welton, who runs the Conservation Finance Network in Washington, D.C., and uh, 
she's, it's an important question, then there's another one after that that falls in the same light uh, as we start to conclude this session. The question is, how might the community of practice, for example, the public, private, and philanthropic conservation finance professional community, help to amplify the efficacy of NatureVest's projects and models? How can all the people who are on this call help to get this curve uh, advancing quickly? Well, I think the, I mean, I think that we sit in a very robust community of practice. I, I, I know Lee well, and, and, and she and I were both part of two different um, conservation finance practitioners convenings in the last, oh gosh, year and a half, the first of which had about 40 people, and the second of which had about 140 people, and, and, I, and including international participation. So I see that this community is growing uh, and accelerating a lot. Um, I got an inquiry about about submitting a project for consideration on the chat. Um, I think that I mean, as as I look at across the the landscape, there's lots of folks. The conservation fund, who I know is on this call, um, EcoTrust. There are a lot of of participants in this marketplace that are starting to show um, that there there is a way to do conservation that creates a return for investors. And so I just think um, really really trying to implement those models um, in a broader way um, to create investable transactions. Because as Bill said, we've got billions of dollars, literally, sitting on the sidelines looking for deals. So we all got to get out there and drum up some deals. And I, I just want to congratulate you all for sharing the precedence that you're setting, because that, of course, is how innovation happens. People take somebody else's good idea and add something to it, and it turns into something even more powerful. So thank you for that. Now, the, I, I will close with a question, uh, which is from uh, an individual whose name I'm not remembering, uh, which is, how do we get in touch with NatureVest and the Nature Conservancy if we think we've got a deal that meets your criteria? You may email NatureVest at tnc.org. All right. And you have uh, Charlotte Kaiser and Bill Ginn's uh, names. They're actually very easy to find on the Internet. Uh, and I, I hope that you get, you know, a dozen really interesting ideas in the next couple of days as a result of uh, these kinds of discussions. Let me close by saying that this dialogue, as well as all of the conservation innovation dialogues that we've had to date over the last uh, number of years, this one will be available online in the next week or so. Uh, it will be there for you to listen to, to share with your colleagues, to come up with uh, innovations that add to the momentum of this uh, community of practice. So I want to thank all of you for attending. I want to thank Charlotte and Bill for your very thoughtful, honest, uh, heartfelt answers. And I want to wish all of you a great summer in the north and a great winter in the south. And we will be back in the third quarter with uh, more grist for the mill. Thank you very much and good afternoon.